So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Hiran Patel. And thank you for um, all attendees to uh, referencing the speaker biographies that we showed this morning. There is a very nice write up on Dr. Patel. I will I would like to take one moment just to indicate that he's the co-chair for the bioequivalent standards for topicals committee within FDA OGD. Uh, Dr. Patel, thank you for moderating. Thank you, Dr. Foley, for introducing me. I'll be the moderator for this session of IVPT method development, validation, and transfer. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sure can. Great, thank you. Earlier, there was a very informative session about utilization of IVPT studies in different contexts. Uh, one size fit all approach cannot be used when it comes to IVPT study design, and that's what we learned in the previous session too. Uh, for the current session, we are going to talk about the IVPT method development, validation, and pivotal studies in context to abbreviated new drug applications, so-called ANDAs, to compare the taste and ripeness products to demonstrate bioequivalence. We will begin with our speaker, Mr. Leandro Santos. He is the director for clinical research at Insight. Prior to joining Insight, he spent 14 years in non-clinical discovery and development at Stifle, GSK, and Dermavant and has worked extensively in the dermal product development. In the interest of time, I'm not going in a detailed bio, which you can find on the website for this workshop. I would like to request you to leave your question or comments in the chat box to all panelists, and we will try to address as many as we can. Without any further delays, stage is all yours, Mr. Santos. Thanks so much, uh, Yuran. And uh, let me just share here for a moment my proper uh, screen. And uh, just quick apologies for that okay so um i believe you can now see the proper screen and you can hear me just fine sounds good perfect you're good to go all right uh thanks so much everyone it's a pleasure to be here speaking today and uh, uh before i start just a quick uh disclaimer uh, per legal requirements and uh, what i want to discuss today um is you know, we have had a lot of a very interesting uh, informative conversations about IVPT, right? So, and the idea here is to continue some of them uh, in the uh, context, right? So, of, uh, of the panels that will be discussion after my presentation. So, I think uh, we all uh, agree we do what we do because of patients, right? So, I think at the end of the day, extremely important to understand the techniques, but uh, I think even more relevant, right? So, it's to uh, keeping perspective that the majority of the skin diseases, while they are not fatal, they severely impair quality of life, and they are the fourth leading cause, right, so of years lost to disability. I think this is extremely important to consider. Further, regardless of your age, uh, at certain point of your life, it's very likely that you unfortunately are going to ex experience some sort of skin diseases, right? So, for instance, uh, we know atopic dermatitis tends to affect uh, most uh, infants, right? So, um, in adolescence, uh, on the other hand, certain diseases, pruritic diseases, they tend to affect more the elderly, like perigonal virus. Um, and one other uh, relevant aspect is the cost, right? So, unfortunately, uh, there is a higher cost involved, especially some of the new medicines that we are currently uh, in development, right? So, and I think. Uh, in the consideration of generics, it's important to consider that, yes, there is the innovator perspective, but also extremely relevant to uh, grant access, right, so to other populations to these medicines. Now, um, when we talked uh, about topical development, right, I think this audience uh, should all agree that developing a topical is not only a matter of putting a, a, a powder into a cream base and then we're good to go, right? So there's a lot of science behind it and it's complex, right? So it's extremely complex to develop semi-solid formulations. And when we look at the data, we essentially had uh, 15 new chemical entities, NEC is approved uh, in the past 20, uh, 10 years. And here I'm even considering some of repurposed molecules, right? So I think the point in here is to say uh, there is uh, a need, uh, clearly, as I've shown before, because of the incidence of skin diseases. And we are talking about products that are challenging to develop. Right? So, and even if we're talking about in the uh, context, right, so of uh, um, uh, generics, it's not a trivial either. Now, 
uh, we're talking about IVPT, and uh, what I want to say uh, is that it, it, IVPT is extremely versatile technique. You can use it in a range, right? So of applications during new chemical entity selection, uh, during formulation, optimization, and selection. Here, obviously, from the innovator point of view. Um, can use it to generate samples for more complex techniques. For instance, this is an example of MALDI imaging that you can have some spatial resolution and see where your drug is located uh, across different skin layers. And finally, the purpose of uh, uh, this uh, workshop, right? So talking about bioequivalence, talking about a uh, generic products. Right? So I think this is uh, uh, relevant to say that just one technique, if you're doing it properly, it can be applied across a range uh, of pharmaceutical development uh, arenas. Now, um, IVPT method development evaluation. I think uh, whenever we talk about IVPT, you also need to talk about bioanalytical method development, right? So these two go hand in hand. You can have the best IVPT method, pay attention to all parameters that we already have discussed here today. If you do not have a good bioanalytical method, probably your data is not going to be very reliable, right? So, and we're going to be discussing uh, that uh, in a moment. Uh, one other consideration, uh, the scientific principles, the scientific concepts behind IVPT, uh, they're actually simple. However, the successful execution of this assay requires considering many variables. And I think that's when uh, things start getting uh, substantially more complex. For instance, here I'm showing some of the uh, key aspects that you need to consider, right? So membrane or skin source, the diffusion cell type, receptor solution, a range of experimental conditions, how are we going to do your data reporting, and even, even some other aspects that uh, are more from the innovator perspective in terms of tissue distribution. In an analogous fashion, developing a bioanalytical method is not trivial either, right? So you need to have the proper equipment, you need to have someone well-trained in those techniques, uh, you need to do sample processing, and in certain cases, depending on the throughput or how many samples you need to analyze, you may also need to consider uh, automation. So I'll be discussing some of the points here. I think uh, uh, consider that what I'm presenting here uh, it will serve the basis of the panel discussions that we have in a moment, okay? Uh, human skin, um, and this, I think, Super important to say that ex vivo or cadaver skin both can be used, right? So generally, when we talk about ex vivo skin, uh, we are considering uh, um, source from elective surgeries, right? So abdominoplasties, for instance, tend to be fairly common, and cadaver skin. No, that's pretty self-explanatory. Those are the true main types that we typically see being used. Um, the first are the two points that I like to consider whenever you discuss this. What's your supplier and what's the process that you're going to take? And then there's some uh, other components across like this two main right? uh, uh, aspects. Cost, if you have a dependable source, the skin quality, quality the storage skin preparation and skin tracking database. Um, the cost of uh, human skin, it can be pretty substantial. And why I say this, right? So depending on your experiments, depending on when you run uh, your pilot study, you may realize that for your pivotal study, you may need to have a, a large number of uh, uh, skin donors. Uh, that's going to increase your cost substantially. In fact, this is the highest expense for consumables. If you consider all in all the amount of solvents that you're going to use for bioanalysis, um, you know, preparing uh, the, the components of your IVPT, they can, uh, cost, but they are not going to be as expensive as human skin. Uh, further, do you have a source of human skin, right? So uh, is it uh, dependable, right? So and how is this skin uh, handled, right? So most of us actually need to rely on other vendors to supply that. We do not have, for instance, a hospital nearby that you can have someone, a, a surgeon, to go there, extract the skin for you, and then provide it and make sure everything is being handled properly. Uh, this is extremely important for consideration. And even during shipment, right? So if the skin is being maintained at conditions that's not going to degrade or affect the skin barrier. Uh, further on, uh, the skin quality, and here I put a number of things, right? So it's uh, uh, critical to consider that depending on the health state of your donor, 
uh, maybe the skin barrier is not going to be optimal. That's going to affect the quality of your experiment, the variability. Um, beyond that, your donor demographics, right? So there may be some variabilities depending uh, on, on the ethnic group uh, that's, that skin is being sourced from. And even further, sometimes you buy skin sections, but a good uh, amount of, of that area, it's actually not usable because you have an excessive amount of hair or because there's some uh, damages to the barrier, right? So uh, when you consider uh, who you are sourcing skin from, if you're going to run this in your lab, uh, those are important questions to ask, right? So it's important to consider that, yes, you are paying a large a sum of money for something that perhaps you are not going to uh, make the best use of because the quality is suboptimal. Now, moving on to the right-hand side in here, uh, process, right? So I do want to uh, start about a skin, skin tracking database, right? So while this is not necessarily, I would say, a requirement, it is extremely helpful to have something like this because if you start seeing drifts in quality or data trends that uh, look um, weird, if you will, right? So you can actually track the skin donor number, track which, ex which experiments use those donors, and then try to understand where that's coming from. And depending where you work, right? So some companies, they may have audits, right? So to a uh, human biological specimen. So it's always good to have something like that. Storage, typically you're talking about, you know, uh, once you get the skin of dermatomet, uh, you are going to keep it at minus 80, right? So there's some special procedures that have been papers published on how to keep it. Typically you are going to keep it sealed uh, in uh, um, packets that without air, right? So, and sometimes even used to fold it uh, with, with aluminum foil, for instance, very important to have a backup freezer if you are keeping large amounts of human skin in your lab, right? So if one freezer goes down, you have something else to quickly change it. Uh, the skin samples there, so you don't lose them, they don't thaw, right? Uh, temperature monitoring and number of freeze thaw cycles, right? So my experience, uh, minimize this as much as possible. If you are going to freeze the skin, freeze thaw it once. Um, but that's my experience, right? So you don't want to have too many. And skin preparation, I know have been discussing about different types of membrane, right? Uh, but the point I want to make is uh, if you are going to do the fat in dermatome, if you are going to do the entire processing house, make sure you have scientists trained for that. This is not a trivial process, okay? So just keep some of these things in mind. And I think in terms of skin preparation, we'll be discussing a little bit more uh, during the panel soon after my presentation. Now, diffusion cell type. We talked uh, a lot about VDCs, vertical diffusion cells. Uh, flow through diffusion cells, um, I've spent most of my career running uh, studies with them, not to confuse with the uh, United States Pharmacopeia USP apparatus four, right? So this is uh, the flow through diffusion cells we have been talking about here. This is the schematic as you have. Um, most of the literature tends to use VDCs. Uh, the point uh, I think we need to make in here, there might be some other, uh, you know, apparatus that you can use, but the big question is, are they uh, uh, really doing their function, keeping the skin se in semi-physiological conditions, keeping a consistent temperature on the surface of the skin, right? Are you able to uh, measure properly the receptor compartment volume of your each one of the diffusion cells, the diffusional area, parameters that are going to dramatically affect the, your results. Uh, and even further, right? So you want to have thermal regulated uh, diffusion cells so you can keep the temperature constant throughout uh, the period of your experiment, as well as stirring rate or flow rate or talk, if you're talking about flow through diffusion cells. And then on this quadrant here that I have on, on the size of my presentation, depend, uh, what I want to emphasize is depending on the equipment you choose, uh, some uh, changes uh, are going uh, to, to take place, for instance, right? So if you have a uh, flow through diffusion cells, uh, generally the drug concentration in the flow through diffusion cells tends to be comparatively lower because the continuous flow. Uh, with that, you may need to have a more sensitive bioanalytical method, right? So changing something on the receptor solution will also change something on the bioanalysis. Also uh, keeping same conditions, right? So the, the VDCs, they tend, on the other hand, have a higher, comparatively higher drug concentration. So now you need to be even more cautious regarding sync conditions, what you're going to add uh, in your uh, um, receptor solution to ensure that throughout the length of your experiment. Uh, the setup, 
I think the VDCs, because they are more common, tends to be more tends to be simpler. Um, the FDCs, the or the flow to diffusion cells, they are slightly more complex. Not many people are familiar with them. And finally, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ching Chuan uh, mentioned this very well, right? So the automation for the flow through tends to be uh, easier. They are more amenable to automation, right? So especially for running a large number of samples. Um, moving on, uh, analytical method. I think we have a, a great resource on the uh, FDA guidance for industry, right? So on bioanalytical method validation. And uh, it's extremely important that you understand that. As I said in the beginning, one can run a virtually perfect IVPT experiment. However, if your bioanalytical method is inadequate, data quality will be affected. Make sure you have a, a good bioanalytical scientist in your lab running these experiments. The two main options that I see, right? So you are either going to run a, a liquid chromatograph UV detector or diode, diode array detector or fluorescence detector or mass spectrometry, LCMS or LCMSMS. Uh, each of them, they have pros and cons, right? So as I show in here, um, overall, yes, uh, uh, UV detection, people are more familiar with, troubleshooting is much easier, but sensitivity, you are going to pay a price on sensitivity, generally speaking, of course, is molecule dependent, but overall, uh, it's an important point to consider, right? So if we're talking about molecules like calcipotrine that uh, has a concentration of 0.05% and you want to understand a good profile, probably is going to be a little bit harder to detect that molecule using uh, UV. You may want to consider uh, LCMS or LCMSMS, right? And uh, the advantages, uh, obviously, right? So much faster runtime, as you can see here, generally two to five minutes per sample, as opposed to 10 to 20 minutes for UV. Um, troubleshooting can be much more complex, obviously, you know, as I've discussed and the upfront investment, right? So generally, a uh, uh, quote-unquote cheap mass spec is going to run at about half a million dollars. Um, regarding the points for bioanalytical method validation, again, right? So this is in the context of analyzing the samples from IVPT. So there are some peculiarities of it. Uh, recall that uh, your uh, analyte is going to be in a heated uh, receptor solution, right? So because Again, it needs to be heated to keep uh, the surface of the thing at 32 Celsius. So uh, you need to ensure that your drug is going to be stable. You need to understand the chemical stability of your drug. Uh, beyond, if you have a receptor solution with some modifiers that can uh, affect, right? So your analytical sensitivity that can even affect the chemical stability of your drug. Um, further, uh, sample preparation. If you are going to do extraction, if you are going to do concentration, you need to ensure that's going to uh, that's not going to affect the, your linearity, right? So, and of course, here I'm not going to cover all other points that one should consider for bioanalytical method development, but just to say that uh, this uh, it can take a lot of time to do, in addition to the IVPT method development in itself. Now, what I show in here, and very busy slide, but probably you have seen some of these concepts being already discussed today, and. Here in the center, I have my typical parameters. But what I want you to get an appreciation for is the number of variables that you need to consider and the aspects that you uh, need to, to take into consideration when you are doing your pilot method development, right? So for instance, the number of donors here, I'm suggesting at, at least four, and this is generally for your pilot study, your pivotal study may require substantially more. Understand your sampling uh, frequency, as we've been discussing here. You generally want to have at least four time points before non zero time points before your max flux, and other at least four other time points after your max flux. So you properly characterize uh, the profile of your drug, right? Um, in terms of dose, generally we're talking about single dose and amounts five to 15 milligrams per square centimeter. You no, know, we'll be discussing that in a moment. Typically speaking, we're talking about unoccluded dose area, um, one centimeter or greater, but recognizing there might be some diffusion cells with less than that. Uh, we typically are looking, right, so for dose depletion, right, so over time, so we properly characterize it, and some other aspects like tissue distribution, but this is not considered as was pointed out previously into the generic application. Now, uh, some 
high level method validation considerations. And uh, uh, keep in mind, this will be discussed during our, our panel. And I believe uh, uh, Paul Lemon will also be discussing more about this. But how do you define your dose? And how do you define if you have sufficient, right? So I think the important definition is sufficient discrimination to use lower dose amounts. Uh, or, you know, if you have reasonable discrimination, which dose do you choose, right? So some of those are, and I hear I'm posing some of these as of now rhetorical questions, but we'll be discussing more in a moment. Um, and uh, uh, regarding the formulations, right? So do we have uh, sufficient discrimination to demonstrate selectivity when we have a graph like this? Uh, but when you have other instances or other experiments, right? So uh, we may show discrimination or may show uh, selectivity, but in the cases that uh, formulation was substantially altered, right? So is this really representative of what we see in real life, right? So some uh, considerations, uh, I think, uh, showcases the complexity of doing the, the method validation for IVPT, right? Now, what I want to say, we generally uh, look, right? So for declines and flux, and I recognize this is not the best graph because we have here the cumulative amount. We should have a plot of flux over time. But to say that some analytes, some molecules and formulations, they can have very unique profiles. Like this is an example that uh, potentially we are not seeing uh, um, skin flux decline, decline anytime soon after 72 hours, right? So what should we do in such cases, right? So you can potentially consider remove the drug after a period of time. So we start seeing decline, right? But just to say there might be exceptions, unique situations that we need to think outside of the box, you know, and how we are going to properly characterize the methods. Now, we talked about uh, tissue levels, right? So once again, this is not something that we typically do in generic applications, more in new chemical entities. But uh, here I just show, you know, an example of drug levels between two formulations to say that uh, depending on the formulation or the drug, you may uh, show, you know, uh, preferential uh, uh, levels in the dermis, for instance, as opposed to receptor solution, right? So to say that some formulations can be more complex to characterize. Generally, if you're doing a generic, you do not need to worry too much about this. But just to say that if you're in the context of the innovator, you probably want to understand well, right? So your drug distribution, especially if you're in the process of uh, designing uh, new formulations for a specific drug. Um, now, this is my last slide, and I just want to spend a, a moment in here to say that um, I, I, I said a number of times that these experiments are complex, right? So the science behind them or the scientific principles perhaps are not as complex. They are somewhat well understood, but when you need to execute these studies, uh, there are a, a number of guardrails, uh, if you will, that you want to implement in your lab. Right? So uh, my experience over the years uh, is extremely important once you have new people running these experiments that they demonstrate proficiency, that they do not only understand the scientific principles, they are familiar with uh, papers in the area, but they are also able to execute and see what is right or wrong. Right? So have someone supervising these people. Uh, that are just starting running these experiments. Uh, another point that is extremely uh, helpful, ensure that you have in your lab a sort of a, a checklist that uh, um, ensure that your equipment is equilibrate, uh, equilibrated, ensure that you do not have air, bu air bubbles before and during the experiment, things that the scientists can do a check so they uh, uh, can run these experiments consistently over time and without making what I call is simple mistakes, right? Um, one other point, how to do troubleshooting. And, um, you know, as I said, whenever you talk IVPT, make sure you talk about the bioanalytical method, bioanalysis. And here I have just an example, right? So we used to have some uh, a reference a material and actually we published this uh, last year, right? So for instance, if you have some receptor solution leaking into the donor compartments, it's extremely simple. But you know, important to have a way of troubleshooting that, right? So that can be skin section being damaged or improperly secured in your diffusion cell, right? So then you need to consider uh, what to do in those cases. And now, of course, we'll be discussing about uh, 
uh, um, some of the statistical analysis in the context later on today. And finally, the bioanalytical part, right? So again, ensure you have someone who is knowledgeable about the methodology. Um, for instance, if you have high background signal in a mass spec analysis, that can be a number of things. Probably, you know, uh, your solvents are contaminated or maybe your receptor solution has been contaminated for some reason. So you need to be uh, able to do a proper troubleshooting, right? So uh, in that sort of experiment and of course, uh, um, minimize the likelihood of such problems being repeated in the future. And so I think the messaging here is uh, have a standardized well, way of running the experiments, have well-trained people uh, who is certainly ensure that you run these experiments well. Um, with that, I'm going to pause here and hand back over to you, Karen. Thank you very much.